Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker. Many hear about the miraculous God who restores, and each of us has our own story. Our next guest, is, guest has lived through marriage, divorce, alcohol, and the supernatural, unexplainable hand of God who transported her from death's door to the comfort of her own bed. Donna Sparks is an Assembly of God's evangelist and author of the popular book, Beauty from Ashes, My Story of Grace. A sought-after speaker for women's conferences and retreats, Donna travels extensively to minister in churches and other venues. She also leads a vibrant and fruitful women's jail ministry through which she has seen God perform countless miracles in the lives of the ladies to whom she ministers. Donna boldly shares the Bible's unchanging truths with an intense desire to equip and encourage others to step forward into the things God has planned for them. She's been married for 22 years to the love of her life, Brian. They have two lovely daughters whom they're raising to know and experience the realities of God, the fullness of His love, and the power to lead them into ministry and blessing. Donna regularly blogs at story-of-grace.com. Here to talk about her best-selling book, Beauty from Ashes, My Story of Grace, is Donna Sparks. Donna, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Thank you for having me. Donna, I was captivated, captured by the opening montage of your journey from marriage to marriage, from alcohol to Xanax to fast red Mustangs to um, tempting and testing God to his very 130 mile an hour limit. And I want you to take us back to kind of the early years before the Donna of the marriages, the Donna of the alcohol, the Donna of the Xanax, the Donna of the Red Mustang. Tell me what it was like being little Donna growing up where you grew up. Well, my testimony is different than most because I did have a good upbringing. Um, my parents made sure that I was in church every time the doors were open. I was raised in an Assembly of God church. I knew all about God from a young age, and I had given my life to Him when I was probably nine years old, and I served Him, you know, as faithfully as I could through my younger years. But after going through two divorces by the age of 23, things changed. Donna, let me stop you there. Husband number one, how did he come into your life? What was your thought and expectation as a woman who had a good godly foundation? Did, was this something that was in him that you recognized in him? Or was this something that was bred out of defiance, rebellion, and I've just had enough and I'm going to go my own way. No, actually, um, it wasn't a rebellious type thing. Um, I thought that we had a solid relationship in the beginning. And, you know, we were both Christians. And, you know, it was just one of those things that, you know, God gives us little signals that, that we should pay attention to. And I never really had peace about my decision but at that point, I was so in love that I just was not willing to hear anything different. And so that's, you know, it wasn't a rebellious thing at all. Um, it was just a decision that I made. You know, you bring up a very, very good point. And I don't want to miss this opportunity to share with our audience that if you are facing a situation, God's universal voice is peace. If you do not have peace about a decision, do not make it. It's just that simple. It's a lesson that Donna, she had the warning and did not act upon it, not point, pointing at Donna and saying, you've done anything different than what I've done in my life. Uh, I've had many situations where I didn't have peace and I went forward, but my advice to you out there in our audience is that if you are weighing in on a decision, especially as a couple, uh, and you don't have peace about it, don't make that decision. 
God will bless the agreement. He will not bless the disagreement. And if you are unsettled by a decision you are facing, heed that stirring and don't act until you have your peace. No matter how head over heels in love you may be, if you don't have peace, don't do it. And I'm talking about the runaway bride. I'm talking about if it's the morning of your marriage. I'm talking about if there's something that God is trying to get your attention, pay attention. And Donna, I appreciate that because it's an extraordinarily huge biblical lesson that all of us in our lives must come to that point of understanding. So you wound up in this marriage. It lasted for a short period of time. How long? Uh, almost a year, a little less than a year. And, what was and then I kind of, I guess, rebounded um, and ended up in another marriage that lasted even a shorter period of time than that. It was four months. And after that, I was absolutely devastated. I felt like I was a complete loser. Um, I felt like I had messed up so much that there was just no hope for my future. Um, it was a very low point in my life. And I had always played piano in church. I loved to play piano for the worship service. And so after that, I felt unworthy to do anything like that ever again. And so I just kind of backed away at that point. How were you received? Were you still going to church? Had you left the church? How did your family respond to these seemingly impulsive decisions that you were making? Well, you know, that's the interesting thing about it. My church family, they embraced me. They continued to love me. Um, they didn't treat me any differently. In fact, my pastor encouraged me. And, you know, it was really, um, I can't say, I can't place any blame on the church or anybody in the church. But after going through two divorces, you know, sometimes we get mad at God. And that's exactly what happened in my case. I was really angry with God because I thought, you know, I've tried to serve you. I've tried to do everything that you've expected of me. And this is not working out so well. And so during that period of time, you know, the enemy always seizes his opportunities and he knows when to get at us. And so he always loves to come along and say that everything that he has caused is God's fault. When we know that the enemy is the one who wants to destroy us, he's the one who is out to steal, kill and destroy. And yet he will come at us and tell us, well, that's God's fault. You know, he shouldn't have allowed that to happen in your life. He shouldn't have allowed you to go through these things. So all of this time you've been serving God, and what has he done for you? And so if we're not really careful, we can start to listen to that negative voice, and we can allow ourselves to become mad at God and question God. And that's where I was. And I had always been self-employed as a cosmetologist, but after going through two divorces, I decided I needed something that was a little different, um, something that was going to provide a steady income and benefits. And so I went to work in a factory. And at that point, I was surrounded by people who were constantly saying, you need to go out and party with us. You need to do this. You need to do that. And... I was working a lot of overtime, so I myself slipped out of church. I quit reading the Word. I quit praying. You know, I thought, with all of this overtime I'm working, God understands. I'm tired. And when we separate ourselves from the body of Christ, and we separate ourselves from His Word and from spending time in fellowship with Him, then these other voices can come in and really, really start to get to us and, you know, the thing I would have never dreamed of doing in my life would be to go out and party and get drunk or do any kind of drugs or anything like that. But after being around all of these other voices and tuning out the small, still voice of the Holy Spirit, 
then it became easier for me to reason. And one of the things I remember them saying was, you know, we're going to have fun. You should just go with us. Just see what it's like. And, you know, so many times the enemy likes to put sin out in front of us. And we deceive ourselves into thinking that we can just skirt around the edges of that sin without really diving in. And that we'll be okay if we're on the outer edge of that sin, but not actually partaking. But that's not the way it works. Because if we give the enemy an inch, he's going to take a mile every time. And so... I made the decision that I would go with my friends out to a club and that I would be the designated driver. See, that was my excuse. That was my justification that it's going to be fine if I go and I'm just outskirting the edges of this sin, but I'm not diving in. And I ended up being the one that was passed out in the nasty bathroom floor at the end of the night. So it's just like I said, whenever we let the enemy in and allow him to present that temptation and put it right there front and center, and we've been tuning out the voice of the Holy Spirit, then he is going to take up residence and try his best to bring us down because that is his ultimate goal. You know, the story you just told is the story of Lot. First, he looked at Sodom, then he moved closer to Sodom, then he moved into Sodom, and then he was deeply entrenched in Sodom. And so uh, it's a biblical trend. And so here you found yourself immersed in this, and this became the new norm, and you began to embrace it. How, how far did you go with it? Well, you see, I started noticing something different about my friends and myself. When we would go out, I would notice that they could drink for a while and then they could stop and they could walk away from it. I never could do that. I didn't realize that I had an addictive personality. And I didn't realize that one of the underlying symptoms was that I was not just going out to party, but I was self-medicating what I had not dealt with. And if we don't let God deal with the things that have hurt us or the things that we've gone through, and we just continue to stuff them deeper and deeper inside and think, you know, I've got this and I can rely on myself and I can get through this on my own, then a lot of times we will end up in that place where we begin to self-medicate with other things that the enemy offers. And so I began to drink more and more. I didn't just go out and drink a little bit. I drank a lot every time. And before long, that led to me stopping at the liquor store after I would get off work. I was picking up liquor and taking it home, and I would drink until I passed out at home every night. Um, there were days that I went into work still drunk from the night before. You know, as I look back to all of the terrible things that I did and all of the mistakes I made, there is no doubt in my life that God was sparing me, that His grace and the prayers of my family and my mother sustained me during that time, that that He was watching over me, that He had His hand over me, even though I was out there and trying my best to just walk down this path of destruction. When you talk about what you were doing, you describe a specific evening. Uh, you're in a red Mustang, and um, the events play out in a particular sequence and I'd like you to lay out that sequence for us. Okay. Actually, you know, during all this time, when I was doing all of this drinking, um, I met my husband, Brian, who is my husband now, and we worked together. And, you know, I never thought that I had any interest in him in the beginning. You know, we were just worked together and that was it. But 
he asked me out. We ended up dating for two months. After two months, we were married. And, you know, the thing about Brian was he was he was not a Christian whatsoever. He was agnostic. He didn't really have an opinion about God whatsoever. He had never been raised in church. He had never gone to church. It just wasn't something that he thought about. And so when we got together, I thought, well, you know, the good thing about him, he is a moral person. He didn't drink or do drugs or party or anything like that. But he didn't care if I did. So I thought, well, this is the perfect perfect situation. You know, he's going to sit home and behave, and I can go out and, you know, do whatever I want. So the first three years of our marriage were really, really rocky. It was really, really bad. And it's only by the grace of God that he put up with me during that time. And as I continued to drink and continued in this pattern, it's like a downward spiral because alcohol is a depressant. And so I would get very depressed and I would think I've got to drink more to keep from being depressed, which would make me more depressed. And so I was just spiraling out of control in this endless cycle. And one of the other things, the main thing that was going on that led to my depression was I had kicked God out of my life. And Brian didn't understand because he'd never had a relationship with God. So he didn't understand the depth of my depression and that it was the absence of that relationship with God that was really contributing to all of this negativity. And I would sit and just cry for hours in depression. I couldn't get out of it. Just such a dark period of time in my life. Um, Unless someone has really been there and experienced, I'm not talking about just the blues. I'm not talking about just feeling really depressed and feeling really bad and it subsiding. I'm talking about full-blown depression where you can't think about anything else. You don't know why you're depressed. You don't understand the depression, but you cannot get out of it. Um, and so Brian couldn't understand that. So he is constantly trying to buy me gifts. He's, you know, trying to do everything that he can to make it better. And he's constantly saying, you know, what can I do to make it better? You know, the men in our lives always feel like they're responsible for fixing us. And when they're faced with something that they can't fix, it often leads to them feeling very helpless. And so I know that during that time it was a struggle for him because he didn't know how to fix what was wrong. But on one particular occasion, he went out and he bought me a brand new Mustang GT, bright red. It was absolutely gorgeous. And I was happy for about five minutes because when the joy and the peace of God is not in your life, you're not going to have lasting peace and joy. You'll have happiness from time to time, but happiness is fleeting. It doesn't sustain you through the hard times. And so the joy was gone, but I would have occasional periods of happiness. And so that was one of those times and I'd, I'd gotten this brand new Mustang and it was absolutely beautiful and I was happy for a short time. But I remember one morning um, waking up and, and telling Brian, I think I'm going to go shopping for some shoes. Now, let me backtrack just a little bit because before this had happened, um, I had a terrible panic attack at work. It was all related to the depression, but a job that I had been doing for years, I felt like I could not do. I felt like I was absolutely going to die. Mm. And it scared Brian, it scared me, and he took me to the doctor and the doctor gave me antidepressants and Xanax. And I thought, yay, I get Xanax. And so anyway, after that, um, I, I didn't take the antidepressants right. I was just using the Xanax. And Xanax and alcohol is a terrible, terrible mix. Um, a very dangerous, dangerous mix. Um, but anyway, during this time, Brian had also mentioned the fact that we hadn't um, got pregnant 
and we both wanted children. So I had also gone to the doctor and the doctor informed me that I wouldn't likely be able to have children. And so that just added to my depression. It just added to everything else that I felt already that I was a failure in. And so I remember this particular morning when I got up and I told Brian, I said, I'm going to go shopping for shoes. And he said, okay. And I went and got in my Mustang. I picked up the Xanax bottle and I swallowed about half a bottle of Xanax with a big swig of liquor. And I took off to the, to the shoe store. Now I was so high while I was in there. I cannot tell you how long I was in there. It was an incredibly long period of time. And I remember trying on shoes and just trying them on over and over. And in that state of mind, you can't make a decision. So I couldn't make a decision. And I had tried on so many shoes. And I had finally narrowed it down to about four pair of shoes. And I said, you know what? I can't decide. I'll just get them all. So I got all four pair of shoes. I went out and I put them in the back seat of my car. I got back in my car. I took the other bottle, of, the rest of the bottle of Xanax, uh, took it with some more liquor and I pulled out on the interstate. Now I did not have any reason to get on the interstate. I lived there in Jackson, Tennessee. I had no reason to get on the interstate and go in an opposite direction. But for some reason I just pulled out on the interstate and I remember driving along and I could just tell that it felt like the car was just barely touching the high spots in the road. I mean, it felt like it was literally floating. And it was like the enemy had just hopped up on my shoulder. And he was just accusing me and telling me, you're a failure. You're an absolute loser. You're worthless. Brian is going to leave you. He's not going to stay with you. He's going to go find somebody else that can give him kids. And just everything that I could that he could possibly present to me to make me feel absolutely worthless. And so as I continue to think about all of that, you know, the enemy, he is, he is so evil when he comes against us like that. And, and like I said, he knows exactly when to jab at us. And I believe that he was using his influences in that time to really get at me and really um, try to convince me that, I had gone too far, absolutely too far. And he just kept on. And I remember thinking, you know, I don't think that God is pleased with me at all. I know that he's not pleased with my lifestyle. And even if I did turn back to him, I don't think he could ever do anything with my life or use me in any type of way. I have messed up too bad. And this is just, I'm a loser. I'm worthless. And in that next moment, it was as if the enemy just said, you know, one quick jerk of the wheel and this could all be over. And as I began to think about that, you know, I think about that now and I think there is no way that I would ever do that. You know, before that, growing up, the thought of ending my life intentionally was just absolutely something I would never consider ever. But in the depths of that kind of depression, when you're not rational and you see no way out and you think that your life is only going to go from bad to worse, then your thoughts are not rational at all. And you think nothing could be worse than what I'm feeling in this moment. And so I began to, to listen and think, you know, that's a good idea. One quick jerk of this wheel and this could all be over. And so I remember looking at the next concrete overpass and thinking, just one quick jerk of the wheel. And I wanted to look around. I wanted to make sure that I didn't take anyone else out. And I remember just putting my foot all the way to the metal, just pushing that pedal down. And I had every intention of jerking that wheel when I got to the next concrete overpass. And like I said in the book, that is when I woke up in my bed at home now, I don't understand how that happened. You know, some might call it a miracle. You know, others say that when you take Xanax and alcohol together that you can lose large chunks of time. 
I don't know if that's what happened, if I just completely forgot what happened after that. But I know either way, however it happened, however I ended up in my bed at home was nothing short of the grace of God. And, you know, when I woke up, I couldn't believe I was in my bed. And I thought, okay, did I dream that? Because that was my first thought. Did I, did I have this dream? Was that something I dreamed? And I pulled the cover back. And when I looked down, I was completely dressed in what I had worn that morning. So I thought, okay, this is kind of strange. So I, I thought, well, I'll figure it out. I'll go and look in my car and see if the shoes are in there. And so I went and I opened the Mustang door and there in the front seat was the empty Xanax bottle and the empty liquor bottle. And in the back seat were the four pair of shoes. And so I knew at that point that God had intervened in some way. And, you know, you would think that that would have been enough to get my attention. You would think that at that point I would have said, okay, somebody's trying to get through to you. But we can become so resistant and have so much pride and be so mad or upset with God that we can feel like we're just determined that we're going to do it on our own. It doesn't matter. You know, we're going to fight this thing out regardless. And I was still in that state of mind. And so I continued on that destructive path even after that took place in my life. We're talking with Donna Sparks, author of Beauty from Ashes, My Story of Grace. As you can hear from Donna, this is quite a provocative story about God's supernatural intervention, and yet that still was not enough. Maybe we have decided that we've tuned God out and we're going to leave ourselves to our own devices, that we can bring about our own salvation. But 2 Samuel 14, 14 makes it very clear what God's desire is. And he says, like water falls to the ground but does not return, we all must die. But God does not desire that. He devises ways for those who are strange from him to return. We're going to take a short break. And when we come back, we're going to hear about how God devised ways, just like he said he would in 2 Samuel 14, 14 to get this one who was estranged from him to return. We'll be right back. Shalom, I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and I've got a question for you. What do you think they're doing with your DNA? Oh, you know that 23andMe kit that you sent off and you got back that report that told you you were Irish, you were French, you were Jewish? Wonder who's interested in that information? It's not like you've sent it off to a database with millions of other people and they can steal your identity. And who would really be interested in that information other than you? Well, maybe your friends and family. But there's one, yes, one, who is so interested in your DNA that it would be something that would make you afraid. And that is Satan himself. Why would Satan be interested in your DNA? Because there is a Y chromosome marker that determines whether or not you are in the line of Aaron. That's right, the biblical line of Aaron the priest. That's because if the priesthood comes back and the high priest takes his role as the head of the Sanhedrin, they will be the ones to call for the return of Jesus. Well, what can they do with your DNA? Well, there are 40-plus countries weaponizing DNA today. And imagine if Satan could weaponize your DNA and use that Y chromosome market to take out the line of the high priest, then Jesus doesn't come back. That is the plot behind the best-selling book, The Codus, now out in second edition, on Kindle, $2.99, also available in paperback. This is a biblical thriller beyond comparison that's going to take you on an incredible journey to understand what they could do with your DNA. I also want to encourage you to visit our website, ignitingandnation.com, and click on Special Offers. There you're going to find the yellow cover of this book, The Seven Laws of Abundant Living, Lessons Learned from the Tree of Life. We're going to take you on a journey in the Garden of Eden to the seed the ground all the way out to the fruit that reveals things of the natural that God is trying to reveal supernatural truths. Contained within these pages are seven laws and seven lessons within each law. They're going to take you on an incredible journey of understanding about the life you live and the fruit you bear. I want to encourage you to click on that yellow cover. We're going to ask for your email. Now we won't send you spam because spam is not kosher, but we will send you the first chapter of this book. 
I want to encourage you to get Seven Laws of Abundant Living Lessons Learned from the Tree of Life. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it on Barnes & Noble. You can get it books a million, wherever great Christian books are sold. Take this journey with me to the Tree of Life in the Garden of Eden and to the Tree of Life we see again at the River of Life. Get your copy today. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Donna Sparks, author of the newly released book, Beauty from Ashes, My Story of Grace. Donna, welcome back to the program. Thank you. Donna, you were headed headlong into that path of destruction. Wide is the path to destruction, and you were full speed ahead down that path of destruction. Even that miraculous waking up in your bed after a time when you should have died wasn't enough to get your attention. So you continued for a period of time down that same path, but what was it that brought you to the turning point? Well, as I had mentioned before, you know, the doctors had told me that we wouldn't be able to have children. And about, I guess, two months or so after this incident on the interstate, um, I found out that I was pregnant and I couldn't believe it. I was just amazed. Um, when I told Brian, he was so excited. We both were just absolutely overjoyed. And, you know, the Holy Spirit, the great thing about the Holy Spirit is how patient he is with us and how he comes in and speaks to us at just the right time. And so the day that I found out that I was pregnant, when I went to bed that night, that's when the Holy Spirit came and began to just speak into me. And he said, what kind of mother are you going to be? because now you're responsible for someone's life other than your own. Mm. And at that point in time, that really hit me like a ton of bricks. And I remembered, you know, my own mother took me to church every time the doors were open. And even if I didn't want to be there, she made sure that I was there. And because of what she had instilled in me, all of those years, I still knew deep down that no matter how bad things had gotten, there was still a place I could go, and that was the foot of the cross. And I thought, you know, if I'm going to have children, I want to at least give them that same opportunity. I want them to know that no matter how bad things get in their own lives, or if they go through situations like I've gone through, that there is still hope that there is a Savior who loves them. And so as I continue to think about that, it really was just, I knew at that point in time, I, I was going back to church. I, I had to get back and get things right with God. And so I didn't know how Brian was going to take it. And so the next morning when I woke up, I said, well, I'm thinking about going to church this weekend what would you think about that? Would you want to go? And he said, sure. And I thought, well, that was easy. And I couldn't believe that, you know, he was willing to go. But you know how, when we've messed up, a lot of us think we don't want anybody else to know our dirt. We don't want anybody else to know that we've failed tremendously. And so my first um, thought was, I want to go somewhere where nobody knows me. I want to go to a church where nobody knows my name, knows anything about me. And I'm just going to sneak in and I'm going to sit on the back pew. And somehow by osmosis, I'm going to leave and everything's going to be fine. You know, in our mind, we imagine that that's how it's going to happen, that we can just secretly come in and make things right with God and then go out and everything's fine. But when I got to church that morning, apparently everyone else had the same idea because the back pew was full. So there were no sitting at the in the back pew. And as we moved up closer to the front and we sat there and that pastor began to speak, it was just like he was reading my mail. And that's the Holy Spirit. He knows what we need. He knows how to speak into us and he knows how to make himself very real to us in our time of need. And I remember sitting there with tears rolling down my face, just thinking, okay, just hurry up and end the sermon and give the altar call. And so 
shortly after that, he did end the sermon. He gave the altar call, and I ran to that altar. And when I looked over, Brian was knelt right beside me. Mm. And I began to pray, and I said, God, I am just so, so sorry. And please forgive me for everything I've done. And in that moment of just pouring out my heart to him and saying, I'm so sorry, can you please, please forgive me? It was that peace that only he provides that just came and poured right back into my heart, poured right back into the empty void that had just been filling that space you know, there's nothing that can take the place of Jesus in our lives. And when that void is there, when that emptiness is there, then the enemy uses that as a sort of vacuum. And it just seems to call out for everything else to try to fill it and give us that peace. And there is nothing in this world that can give us peace like Jesus Christ. He is the only one who can fill that void and and make us complete and satisfied and whole and give us that joy that is everlasting, that does not leave in our times of trouble. And so after that, um, Brian and I both, you know, I made things right with God. He gave his heart to Christ for the first time and and we left that service and we were happy. from that point on, I, I didn't have the craving, the desire for alcohol. And, you know, it's like I tell people all the time when I share my testimony, God will take away the addiction, but the temptation is going to remain. So we don't automatically walk away and, and think that we're just going to stand, you know, strong against it. That temptation is always going to be there because the tempter is still in the world. And he is the enemy of our souls. And so he's going to tempt us even more a lot of times after we come to Christ because he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. So after that time, though, that desire for the alcohol and the drugs was gone. And everything was great. Everything was just wonderful. We were in a a really good church, loved it. And it was only a couple of years later, and we found out that our second little girl was coming along. And at that time, Brian came home and I was a stay at home mom. And he came home and he said, what do you think about moving to Iowa? And I said, I don't think anything about moving to Iowa because I have no intentions of going there. And you know, God is funny sometimes because of all the options and all of the places that we could have gone to, we ended up moving to Iowa. And I didn't understand it at first because I was in a healthy church. I was in um, just a wonderful church family. And I had been soaking it up like a sponge these past two years because I needed that so desperately. But when we moved to Iowa, it was like it was just night and day. It was completely different. And I felt like God had literally taken me and dropped me in the desert And I said, Lord, I don't understand why you would do this at this time when I was in a good church and I was soaking it all in. And now you have just seemingly dropped me in the desert. Why? And, you know, in those times, what I realized of myself to be true is while I was sitting there in a good church and I had a pastor who was really bringing the word and and just really preaching and and bringing it home to us, I was reliant on him, completely reliant on him to bring the word to me. And then when I left on Sunday mornings, I thought I was good until the next Sunday. But when God gets you away from everything that you know, your friends and your family, and sometimes he has to do that. Sometimes he has to take you out of your comfort zone and put you somewhere completely different then I realized if I was going to maintain that relationship, I was going to have to get the word and get in it and begin to study the word, begin to seek his face. And even though I knew that God had forgiven me at this point in time in Iowa, I knew that he had forgiven me. I knew he had washed away my sins, but I still felt like he might be a little bit mad at me or a little bit disappointed. 
And I think a lot of times we deal with that guilt. We deal with that shame of our past and we think, well, I, I know he's forgiven me, but I know he's got to be really disappointed. But miraculously, during that time when God had just taken me away from everything that was familiar and put me in this isolated area, he began to speak to me. And it was in that time that he called me into ministry. And I couldn't believe that he wanted to use me. It was something that I really had a lot of discussion with him about because I thought, God, there's no way you could use me. But I was so wrong. When you were called, it sounds exactly like what he did with Moses, is that he removed him, set him apart till he could get Moses out of Moses, and it sounded like he needed to get Donna out of Donna. Mm -hmm. And so you were called into ministry, um, and this was the prison ministry? No, he actually called me first to be an evangelist. Okay. And there was a guest speaker who came to our church one night, and he was, everybody had gone to the altar for prayer. And he came up and he started praying for me. And he said, Ma'am, he said, God has just shown me that he's called you to be an evangelist. And I thought, okay, you've lost your mind. You know, I thought there is no way that God would ever use me as, as an evangelist. And so he told me that a couple more times and I just refused to believe it. Well, he followed me out into the parking lot that night and he said, ma'am, he said, I know that you just totally disregarded everything that I said to you back there. He said, but I know what God showed me. And I said, but you don't understand. You don't know my past. And he said, and you don't know my past. And he said, that's the great thing about God. When he puts our past behind us, it's gone. And he said, let me tell you something. And I don't want you to ever forget it. And I've never forgotten these words. He says, God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. And if you try to put him in a box, he will blow that thing open every time. And that has been absolutely accurate in my life because God has done so many miraculous things that there's no way that I can, you know, I still can't wrap my mind around it. I still pinch myself and think, God, you know, why me? Why? But he's always used the most unlikely people to do the most unlikely things. And that's what I love about him because he wants people to know it isn't about the vessel. It's about what he pours through the vessel. And so that's my heart is that I can always be used by him, that I put away my own insecurities. I put away the thoughts that I have about my own abilities and just trust in his abilities because he will do it. When you heard this message from this man and he was calling you to become an evangelist, did this change your kind of tuning into being able to hear more clearly from God? Did this get you on the path because ultimately you began to walk in power and authority, you went through a season of doubt, and then you got this next call and this next call for most would be a dreaded call. And the call is you're going to jail. Yeah. So after I had, um, you know, first of all, God called me drastically and began to open doors for me to speak for women's conferences all over the nation. And I thought, wow, you know, this is, this is awesome. And I was speaking for church events, you know, and then, he just began to slowly put it on my heart to go in and speak to ladies in the jail, um, ladies that were in hopeless situations, ladies that had experienced the same things that I had come from. And, you know, at first it was a little scary because I thought, you know, I don't know what that's going to be like to walk in and have these doors, you know, close behind me and I'm in there with them by myself. But, you know, when God puts something on our heart, he provides a way and he provides what we need in that situation. And, you know, as I go into the jail, even today, um, when I walk in, I will tell them, you know, none of you here have done anything worse than I've done. 
And I get some pretty strange looks when I say that. But when I just share my story and share what God has done in my life, the tears just begin to fall. And it's the Holy Spirit that does the work. It's the Holy Spirit that does the drawing. And he draws them in. And when they can see that there's hope for all their hopelessness, when they can see that no matter what their past looked like, that God's more concerned with what they do with their future and that he can do the miraculous through them if they will surrender it all to him because that's what it comes down to. Um, God didn't start using me until I absolutely said, okay, God, I don't know exactly what your plans are for my life. But if you can do anything with this life of mine, and if you can use me in any way whatsoever, I give myself completely and totally over to your purposes. And it was in that moment that when I said that, that that's when God just began to open the doors and just do the miraculous. And that is my desire for everyone, men or women, to see that your past is behind you. Your past doesn't define you. Once you come to Christ and you give it all to him and you lay it down at his feet and you ask him to forgive you and to be your savior, the past is behind you. What matters now is what you do with your future. That's what's ahead. We don't look behind. The Apostle Paul says, looking not at what's behind, but pressing on. And that's what we have to do. We have to press on and not worry about the past. God is far more concerned with what we do with our future than what we did in our past. Oh, amen to that. Now, you would think that because you were on this role that uh, your family would be much more receptive and open. They saw the fruit. They saw all that. But you describe in the book the H word, and you talk about an encounter with a relative. And I think we all have that relative and the one that's not convinced that what they see is actually real. And you share a story about inviting them to church, and they have a response, and that's what you entitled the H word. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's not just relatives that I've heard it from. It is such a common excuse. So many people will say, well, I'm not going to go to church because it's full of hypocrites. And I don't like hypocrites, and I don't want to be a hypocrite, so I'm not going to go to church. And, you know, I've heard people say, well, most of the people sitting in the church are in worse condition than I'm in, or they're living a life worse than I'm living. And I have to remind them that we don't go to church for the other people. We're not there to evaluate what their lives look like. They're not there to evaluate what our lives look like. We're there for Jesus. We're there for one reason only, and we go there to lift him up, to worship him, to draw close to him. And when we make him our focus, when we make him our goal, and we get our eyes off of other people, then he ministers to us. And, you know, we can blame other people all of our lives and, and say, well, you know, my sin may not be as black as their sin, but all sin is sin. And one day we will stand before God and you're not going to answer for Sister Sue that's sitting in the pew across from you. You're going to answer for yourself and yourself alone. So blaming that and using, you know, hypocrisy as an excuse and saying, well, I'm not going to go to church because they're a hypocrite is not doing you any favors. It's not justifying what you're doing. Well, you are absolutely right. We have about uh, a minute and a half left in this uh, segment. So I'd like you to speak directly to the audience and let them know that they too can come from where you came from and they too can wind up in the loving arms of a father that it's never too late. Absolutely. That's one thing. If I can ever focus on any one thing and drive one point home is that it does not matter where you have been. Your sins are not too many. They are not too great. God's grace is able to forgive even the darkest sin. There, You have not gone too far. That's one of the things that I worried about is, have I gone too far? No, you have not gone too far. We can always find grace at the foot of the cross. We only have to bow down and ask him to forgive us and come into our hearts and be our savior. When we do that, then he can do the miraculous in our lives. He can do far more with your life than you could ever do with it yourself. 
and the things, the plans that he has in store for you are beyond your wildest imagination. There is hope, there is forgiveness, and there is just a wonderful life ahead of you when you turn it over to Christ and give him all. Amen and amen. Beautiful words, inspirational words, an incredible journey by our author, Donna Sparks, author of Beauty from Asher's Her Story of Grace. It doesn't start out pretty, but it ends up magnificently beautiful. And her story is a story of every one of us who have journeyed from the darkness of this world into the light that the Messiah brings to us and how he's the one that can transform us and bring beauty from ashes. Donna Sparks, thank you for sharing your story here with us on Revealing the Truth. Thank you so much, Pastor Eric. God bless you. We're going to take a short break, and when we return, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth. <laughs> 